Can you read this? Probably not. It's gobbledygook. It's just a mishmash of letters and symbols that don't make any sense. But this is what 92,000 adults in central Alabama see every day. This is what they see when they pick up a newspaper. It's what they see when they pick up a prescription bottle or a job application. This is what they see when their child hands them a book and says, please read me a story. This is what Mr. Fred sees. Fred is an 88-year-old man who comes faithfully to his reading class at the Literacy Council. He's a Korean War vet, and he's the proud father of four grown children, all of whom he put through college because Fred values education. But when Fred's wife died four years ago, he knew he needed some help because she had kept his secret all those years, and she had navigated the written world for him. This is what Joy sees. Joy is in her early 20s. She's a lovely young woman who's really smart and wants nothing more than to build a bright future for herself. But Joy dropped out of high school when she was 15. And she didn't drop out because of the usual reasons kids drop out of high school. She wasn't pregnant, she wasn't in a gang, she wasn't involved in drugs. Joy dropped out because she was an undiagnosed dyslexic and she couldn't read well. And she was falling farther and farther behind. And as she fell farther and farther behind, she grew ashamed and embarrassed. This is what 92,000 adults in central Alabama see every day because they are functionally illiterate, which means they don't read at at least a fourth grade level. That's 92,000 people walking around in our neighborhood, our community in Birmingham, our friends, the people we come in contact with every day who don't have the basic skills to decipher the English language. That is 92,000 reasons why I get out of bed every morning. I dream of a world where everyone can read. I dream of a world where a book like this can unlock all the possibilities and all the opportunities for anyone who can open it. Verbal communication has been around since the dawn of man. In fact, all living species have the need to communicate their wants and their desires to the others in their community. This is Mother Nature's way of ensuring that our species survives. But written communication has only been around for about 9,000 years. It is purely a man-made invention. Thousands of years ago, people like the Egyptians and the Phoenicians started figuring out ways to put symbols and pictures with the words that we speak so they could preserve their history for future generations. And believe me, written language was an incredible invention. It changed mankind forever. It's what separates us from other mammals on Earth. But like a lot of good inventions, it came with a price. Because in those early days, only a few people could decipher the words and the symbols. And those people held all of the power. In the early days, almost everyone was illiterate. There were very few people who could read. And you know what? The people who could read, they decided that was OK. Because illiteracy has been used as a tool of oppression for thousands of years. The early church used illiteracy a lot. They wrote their Bibles in ancient languages that no one could understand. They locked them away and kept them away from the common people and only gave the priests and the elders in the churches the keys to that knowledge. We used illiteracy in this country in the days of slavery. We refused to teach an entire race of people how to read and write so we could keep them subservient. Illiteracy is still used around the world today. There are millions and millions of women and girls who are not allowed to be educated. They're not allowed to learn to read and write because the men in their society want to maintain their dominance over them. Illiteracy has often been used as a tool of oppression. Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, knew that literacy was the key to opportunity for his people. You see this quote, it's one of my favorites. Once you learn to read, you will be forever free. You can walk in any office at the Literacy Council and find this hanging on somebody's wall or sitting on their desk because it reminds us 
every day why we get up and why we go to work and why we do what we do. Because there are 92,000 people who need us. Now that number can get you down. That's a lot of people. That's enough people to fill up Brian Denny Stadium on a, on a football Saturday. That's a lot of people walking around in our neighborhood who cannot read and write. But you know what? In the overall scheme of things, we're getting better. A little history of illiteracy in Alabama. Around the turn of the last century in 1900, it is estimated that anywhere from 45 to 50 percent of Alabama's adults could not read. Now keep in mind a large number of these people were the slaves and the children of slaves who had never had an opportunity at education. So we started chipping away at that. In 1990, the federal government issued the first ever wide-scale study of adult skills in our country. And at that time, it was estimated that about 24% of adults in Alabama could not read or write. This number was staggering. It was a heck of a lot better than the earlier numbers, but it was still staggering. The business community took notice of this because literacy is an economic development issue. It's a workforce development issue. And the business community said this is not acceptable. So they got together with the United Way and the Junior League, and they created the Literacy Council. You fast forward 25 years, we're still chipping away at the problem, and we've gotten better. Right now, Alabama ranks 36th in the nation in literacy. It's one of the few things we're not 48th or 49th in. But we still have about 15% of our adults who do not read well enough to function in society. 92,000 people. We have to figure out a way to put a stop to the cycle of illiteracy. And this is what we do at the Literacy Council, and we do it one reader at a time. Readers like Essie, who's a 45-year-old grandmother who came to us last year. Essie left school when she was 10. Because her father left home, her mother was a raging alcoholic, and someone had to help raise her three little brothers and sisters. She did what she had to do. She didn't have a choice. But she valued education, and she knew it was important, and she made sure all of those brothers graduated from high school. And now Essie takes care of her grandchildren during the day while her daughter goes to work as a nurse. Essie knows she needs to be there. She knows she needs to be there to guide them through the educational system. But she only reads at a third grade level. And she knew it wouldn't be long before that five-year-old outpaced her in her skills. So she comes to class every day. So she can stop that cycle of illiteracy. We're doing it one reader at a time. But you know what? There's 92,000. That's a lot of people. There's actually a more efficient way to stop the problem. There's a more efficient way to put an end to illiteracy and thus the cycle of poverty. And that's what we aim to do. Last year, the Alabama State Department of Education issued the results of the first ever ACT Aspire reading assessment that was given to all third graders in 2014. All the third graders in the state of Alabama. And the news was dismal. In Birmingham metro area, the five county area that we serve, only 35% of our kids were reading proficiently at the end of third grade. Think about that. Only 35%. These are our kids, our neighbors, our community, and only 35% of them are benchmarking in third grade in reading. Why is this important? Third grade reading matters. Third grade reading is a critical milestone for any child because it is a key indicator of that child's ability for success later on in the educational system and later on in life. If you don't meet this critical milestone, you got serious trouble. Because you see, we teach kids to read from kindergarten to third grade. They learn to read in those early years. But from fourth grade on, they read to learn. So if you don't have that critical skill by the end of third grade, we're not going to teach the alphabet in fourth grade. We're not going to teach phonetics again. And if you don't have that skill by then, you're going to fall further and further behind. A child who is not reading on grade level in third grade is four times more likely 
to drop out of school than his peers. And you know what happens to kids who drop out of school? They are 10 times more likely to wind up in prison. Our prisons, our welfare rolls, our homeless shelters are full of people who are functionally illiterate. Not 80% of these kids that are falling behind are from low-income families. So they don't have that support network behind them to help them when they fall, to catch them and pick them back up. And I'll tell you something, not one of the 3,600 adults that we taught last year could read in third grade. They'll all tell you that. Because if they could, they wouldn't wind up on our doorstep when they're 28 or 38 or 88 like Mr. Fred. I've been involved in the reading industry for a long time, and I can tell you, it's a heck of a lot easier to teach an 8-year-old to read than it is an 88-year-old, no matter how hard that man works. So we're going to do something about it in Birmingham. This year, we're launching the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. This is a national movement that comes out of the Annie Casey Foundation in Washington, D.C. And the campaign is not a program. It's not a new curriculum. It's not a new way to teach kids how to read. It is a movement. It is a movement to get everyone in our community laser focused on third grade reading. Because this is an economic issue. It's a workforce development issue, and we all should care. Because these are our kids, these are our neighbors, this is our community. So the campaign is about getting all of these people around the country and in Birmingham laser focused on making sure kids are reading by the end of third grade. It's about bringing everybody to the table, not just our teachers and our principals and our superintendents, but it's about getting our business leaders to the table. It's about getting our elected officials to the table. It's about getting people from the state of Alabama, from our legislature, to the table. It's about engaging nonprofits and churches and synagogues, anybody that cares about our community. It's about bringing everybody to the table, laser focus on getting all of our kids to read by third grade. And it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Last Friday, we had a big rally at Oliver Elementary School. Mayor Bell was there. He signed on to the project. The head of the United Way was there. The city council was there. We had business leaders. We had Regions Bank. We had 250 excited kids. Even Blaze from UAB was there. And I got to tell you, the kids were a little more excited about Blaze and his dance moves and the fact that the mayor and all these important people were in their gymnasium. But that was okay because the message was clear. The message was clear to those kids and those teachers that we are all here to support them, that everybody in this community is going to be a part of this campaign to ensure that all kids are reading. And you know what? Every single one of you in this audience can help. There's something every single one of you can do. You can be a tutor to a child or an adult. You can host a book drive. You can work at an after-school program or a summer program. You can be a mentor to a kid who's at risk. You can give generously to the Literacy Council and all these other organizations that are helping make this real for us in Birmingham. Because I dream of a day when everyone can read, and you can help me make that dream come true. Thank you.